Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Sitting in for Aaron Powell is Jason Kuznicki, a research fellow at the Cato Institute and the editor of Cato Unbound. Our guest today is Tim Sandifer. Tim is the principal attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation and the author of three Cato books, the three Cato books being The Cornerstone of Liberty, Property Rights in the 21st Century, The Right to Earn a Living, and his newest book, The Conscience of the Constitution, The Declaration of Independence, and The Right to Liberty. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Tim. Thanks for having me. So, Tim, for the first question, I think is, what is the conscience of the Constitution? Uh, the conscience of the Constitution is the classical liberal political philosophy articulated in the Declaration of Independence. It's the principle that people are basically free and use that freedom to create a government in order to protect their freedom, but that when government is destructive to their rights, they have the right to alter that government. And the reason that that's important is that that reversed in many ways the political philosophy underlying monarchies and, and, and today's dictatorships, which holds that – individuals are not basically free, that government creates their freedom and that the presumption is against individual freedom. So I think the conscience of the Constitution is the principle that we are all born with equal freedom. Now, if I could just be a bit of a devil's advocate here, uh, it's sometimes said that, well, the Constitution is operative law in the United States. The Declaration is not. Uh, so if you're arguing in front of the Supreme Court, it's great to cite the Constitution. You want to be able to do that in defense of your argument. But if you cite the Declaration of Independence, they're Bad not form, going to, to be – yeah, they're not going to be on board with that and they're right. not going to, to weight it at all in the same way. They might say, well, yeah, that's nice but that's not how we decide things here. What would you say to that? Uh, well, it is true that it's – it would normally be bad advice to tell a lawyer to cite the declaration in an argument in the Supreme Court. But I think that's as a result of generations of bad jurisprudence and bad political philosophy. However, the declaration has played a role in court decisions very recently. In fact, um, a good example is uh, Tro Troxel versus Granville was a case in 2000 involving a law that said that parents had to allow visitation rights to grandparents even if they didn't want to. So if you know you and your wife broke up and, and you had the kids and her parents wanted to visit the kids, you couldn't stop them. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court struck that down as unconstitutional. Justice Thomas with the majority holding it unconstitutional and Justice Scalia dissenting, saying he thought it was constitutional. And Scalia says, although I think that one has a natural right to, to direct the upbringing of, my, of one's children, that isn't protected by the Constitution. Um, and, and the argument was whether that is part of the liberty protected under the Declaration. Or a more recent example in Grutter versus Bollinger, the big uh, uh, race preferences case, Justice Thomas wrote this wonderful dissenting opinion saying he thought that it's unconstitutional for the government to you know, treat people differently based on race. And his dissenting opinion consists of like – I think it's five parts, six parts actually. In part one, part two, part three, part four, part five. And then there's two or three sentences at the end separated by three asterisks. And at the top it says, Justice Thomas wrote a dissent with which Justice Scalia agrees as to parts one, two, three, four, and five. He didn't join the last two sentences and the reason why is because those are the sentences in which Thomas quotes from the Declaration of Independence. So those are just some minor examples but there's a, a, a more recent – or another example in which – I can't remember the name of the case off the top of my head but the dissenting opinion by Justice Stevens says you know, when we talk about the liberty in the 14th Amendment, I would think that it means not just the, the rights that are specified in the Constitution but also the liberty that is referred to in the Declaration of Independence. So I do think it, it, it plays a role but more importantly, uh, first of all, it is part of our law. It appears in our in, in the United States Code. It's in Volume One, Chapter One of the Statutes at Large, and we date our political institutions from 1776 because of it. I mean, it has at least some legal role to play, and I think that it that the other role that it has that's been neglected is it should play a role in setting the framework for understanding the Constitution. So, uh, to walk us back a bit and fill anyone in who who maybe forgets eighth grade civics class. Um, the Declaration of Independence, how would you describe it as a legal and philosophical document and what theory is it based on? Well, as a legal document, the Declaration of Independence is a constitution of the United States. It, what I mean by that is it constitutes us as a people. It declares that we are no longer Englishmen. Uh, a lot of people like to say 
that the American founding fathers were asserting the, the rights of Englishmen against the British crown. Well, they had done that. And what they did on July 4th, 1776 was they said, we're no longer Englishmen. Mm-hmm. These are now the rights of all mankind that we're referring to. And so as a constitutional document, it declares the United States separate from Great Britain and creates the United States as a corporate entity. And it creates them unitedly. This is an important point. Is It does not say that the states are independent of one another. It's the, it says these united colonies are free and independent states and, these, and they, are, they are independent unitedly. So it creates the American nation as a legal document. As a philosophical document, it's a, it's a statement of plain vanilla Lockean principles drawn from the second uh, treatise on civil government by John Locke. And you know, late in life, Jefferson was approached about this. They said, somebody said, well, you know, your wording is like – Word for word from Locke, did you just plagiarize John Locke? And Jefferson said, it wasn't my job to come up with any new principles. It was my job to articulate the principles that everybody believed at that time. And that's what I did. And I didn't – he says, I didn't turn to any books. I didn't have to because we all agreed on these principles and that's, that's what, we, what I came up with. And then going forward to the Constitution um, – or well, actually, let's go forward to the sort of beginning, late part of the 18th century for jurisprudence. Um, we had a, a guy named Blackstone. Uh, become very central to the law. Um, and in the book, you talk about how that is a little bit misleading. Um, yeah. So we go have Declaration and the Constitution, and then a lot of formulation of American law has a lot of references to Blackstone. And we still do it today. So the, who was Blackstone and, and what was wrong with that in light of the thesis that you're talking about here? William Blackstone was an English judge and legal scholar uh, and professor of law at Oxford. And in the 1760s, he published a series of four books called the, the um, Commentaries on the Common Law. And in these books, he try, just tried to express what English law was in general on various topics. And he wrote in a very clear and readable style. It's even very – it's still readable today, very, very accessible. And as a result, it became very popular, especially in the, United, in the United States. And it became kind of the book to go to for lawyers who were studying. Well, the problem with that is that Blackstone disagreed with Locke on certain important philosophical principles. He, by name, he rejects Locke's views. And Blackstone believed that government is inherently sovereign. It has certain basic powers. Uh, and he called this this um, supreme, irresistible, absolute authority to do everything that is not naturally impossible. He said this this power is somewhere in every government, somewhere. And what Jefferson and others had a problem with was they said, well, no, the, the Declaration of Independence says we have individual rights and government's uh, sovereignty is limited by those individual rights. It has no authority to intrude on those rights. And so – the founders had a complex relationship with Blackstone. He was becoming more popular among the young law students, but Jefferson was really worried about this. In his last letter to James Madison, Jefferson says, you know, the younger the, the kids today are reading Blackstone. That's a real problem. James Wilson at the, from the Constitutional Convention, he said the same thing. So they, they rejected this idea of absolute unlimited sovereignty and held to the idea that government is sovereign only within the boundaries of, the, of individual rights. So uh, well – Blackstone's idea of a a omni sovereign state, a state that enjoys all of the powers of sovereignty, is is maybe not so popular today. I would say there is another view of sovereignty which is shared by many of the folks on the left, uh, which is that democratic majorities enjoy more or less that type of sovereignty. Right. And I'd like to ask you about that because my sense is that one of the key themes of your book is this tension between democratic sovereignty as a theory and the idea that individuals have inalienable rights that even majorities will do wrongly if they transgress on. And I'd like to ask you uh, to illuminate on that a little bit. Yeah. So what happened with Blackstone was that he was adopted by certain thinkers in the United States and endorsed especially by southern defenders of slavery. And they said, OK, the, the powers uh, – the absolute power that Blackstone speaks of used to belong to, to parliament. But when we declared independence from, from Great Britain, those powers were inherited by the state governments. And so now the state governments have supreme, irresistible, absolute authority to do everything that's not naturally impossible. And they may have written individual rights into their state constitutions, but those are just privileges that the government can override if it wants to. And of course, there's certain – some of that authority was given away to the federal government at the Constitutional Convention. But for the most part, states are sovereign and have this supreme, irresistible power. Uh, so it's a Democrat, Democrat, democracy version of, of William Blackstone's view of sovereignty. And that became very popular in the years leading up to the Civil War. 
it's interesting. There's the there's some of these really amazing uh, court decisions from Supreme Courts of States during the 1850s. I talk about one in particular in the book called Sharpless versus Mayor of Philadelphia, where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court endorsed this Blackstonian vision of absolute government authority. But there was another decision just a few years uh, before that called Billings versus Hall in California, in w- which rejected that view and said, no, uh, state governments do have a lot of power, but they don't have the power to intrude on natural rights, even if their constitutions don't provide those kinds of protections. The law will still protect those rights. And that tension between those two viewpoints, I think, lays the foundation for what ultimately became the division of the Civil War. Uh, so th- yeah, that's a perfect getting up to the Civil War because you have a lot of interesting things to say about the Civil War in the book um, and libertarians often have some pretty right. big conversations about the Civil War. Uh, you have a view of the Civil War um, th- uh, based on certain thinkers. Frederick Douglass I know is, is one that you bring up uh, that says that, that it was – Slavery was abhorrent to the Constitution at the beginning, even despite the concessions of it. Right? Um, would you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. So, the, in their view, slavery was something like you might say it was a social institution. It was it wasn't created by the government. In fact, Southern political leaders were quite emphatic that slavery had not been created by positive law, and so the, it was more like you might say the institution of polygamy or. Or and not in a moral sense, but but what I mean is that that was a social institution, and the political state then came into being with that institution already in place. And so, to them, they thought that the Constitution made accommodations for this existing institution, but that in the long run, the Constitution's protections were ultimately incompatible with slavery. Now, some of these anti-slavery thinkers, particularly Lysander Spooner and Joel Tiffany. They said slavery is just already unconstitutional and their reasoning was the declaration says one people. It doesn't distinguish between white and black. So all people in the United States must be part of the people of the United States, which which Spooner said must have freed the slaves right then. Mm -hmm. They must have been free already. And then the constitution says we the people of the United States and – he says – and if, in fact, if you look, blacks in some states could vote for delegates to the ratification conventions for the constitution in 1787 mm-hmm. and 88. So if they are people, then they are protected by the due process clause and other clauses of the constitution and no state may intrude on their rights because the constitution says in article 4 that you are entitled to the privileges and immunities of citizens of the several state when you go from one state to another. Now – the problem with the original constitution, of course, is that it didn't define citizenship. So the constitution refers to citizenship, but it never explains what that means. So it says, for instance, the president must be a natural born citizen. Representatives have to be citizens of the United States. The Privileges and Immunities Clause protects the rights of citizenship. But until the 14th Amendment was ratified, states gave you your citizenship and then you were a citizen of the United States through that. Well, the problem with that was in some states, free blacks could become citizens and in other states they couldn't. So you had situations like the um, the Police Act of uh, South Carolina, which said that all black sailors on ships landing in ports in Charleston or in, in South Carolina um, had to be put in jail un- at the ship captain's expense upon arrival. Upon arrival, and if uh, until the ship left, and if the captain failed to pay the bills for his imprisonment, then the sailor would be sold into permanent slavery. Well, now. A black man could become a citizen of Massachusetts and thereby a citizen of the United States. And Massachusetts had a lot of sailors then as well as now. And a sailor could very well land at a port in South Carolina and now he's being imprisoned for committing no crime in violation of the Privileges or Immunities Clause. So you have this real problem about about citizenship uh, that leads up to the Civil War. And the anti-slavery constitutionalists said federal citizenship comes first. Your rights belong to your federal citizenship and at least free black people and possibly even slaves are citizens of the United States and therefore entitled to these protections. Now, you know, these guys disagreed amongst themselves. Lysander Spooner was probably the most radical. Other people like John Quincy Adams were more conservative, but even they said, for instance, the the Missouri crisis of 1820, Missouri wants to get into the union. It proposes a state constitution that allows it to exclude free blacks from its borders. And John Quincy says, well, this violates the Privileges and Immunities Clause. You can't do that. 
And they worked out this meaningless compromise, of course, mm-hmm. where Henry Clay you know, negotiated this thing where, where they included in the admission law. They said, well, OK, but we will, we pro- Ma- Missouri must promise to interpret that clause of its constitution not to violate the federal constitution. Mm-hmm. What does yeah, that mean? Yeah. Nobody knows, yeah. right? So it put off the conflict. And anyway, so the anti-slavery constitutional theory, they do disagree amongst themselves, but they had certain broad principles, and that is federal citizenship first. That includes individual rights, and no state may justly intrude on those rights. And they tried at first in courts and in Congress to advance this, this interpretation of the Constitution, and ultimately it turned out they had to amend the Constitution, and that's the 14th Amendment. Now, When, when the uh – 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are ratified. We see the death of the idea that the states have the kind of unlimited Blackstonian sovereignty that that some people said that they had before. Right. And whether they had it before or not is immaterial. It's gone now. We all agree with that. But the the beast rears its head again in the progressive era with the idea of the federal government now holding more or less that type of sovereignty as opposed to the idea that it has a limited grant of power. So so what happens in this next stage of the story? You know, one of the interesting things about constitutional law and really about all all legal interpretation is the question of when does something become unconstitutional? Mm -hmm. So let's take, for example, Lawrence versus Texas, the recent decision in which the Supreme Court said that states can't criminalize same-sex sexual conduct conduct in private. The question is, well, when did it become unconstitutional? The answer is it was always unconstitutional, right? And yet it continued to go on because there was no case to address the question and the, and this, and the states were prohibiting this kind of conduct and so forth and, and there were debates about its constitutional, constitutionality going on. Then the court interprets the constitution and says it was always unconstitutional for, the, for states to, to intrude in this way. So with the 14th Amendment, the question isn't did the, did the authors of the 14th Amendment change the constitution to eliminate the Blackstonian vision of sovereignty? It's more accurate to say what they did was they made clear that that had never been correct and that the, the states were never sovereign in that sense. And, and if there was any question about it, this amendment would settle it. And the way it does that is, among other things, it strips states of the last vestiges of sovereignty by defining citizenship and defining it at the federal level. So states have no say in who their own citizens are. Um, it, that decision is made for them by the Constitution and you're a citizen of the state wherein you reside whether the state likes it or not, right? So it was more of a clarifying than a changing amendment. Unfortunately, it didn't really clarify things enough for some people and so the very first Supreme Court case to interpret the amendment was the Slaughterhouse Cases of 1873. And what the court does there is it totally ignores the deeper ratification, the meaning of the, of the ratification of the 14th Amendment and it, it, it endorses the obsolete – states' rights view of the Constitution and it says, was it the purpose of the 14th Amendment to, to say that the federal government will protect civil rights even against state authority? Why, that can't possibly be the way because it's never been that way before. Well, I also recall that the the decision all but said that – such a view would entail way too much work for the courts. Yeah, well, that's and right. and mm-hmm. to me, this can't possibly be the proper way to interpret the Constitution. If it means that the <laughs> courts have, have to, to do a hard. lot of work to achieve yeah. justice, well, isn't that their job? It, it really ought to be. Um, and not only that, but there was another case I mentioned in the end notes actually, um, a California state court case that interpreted the Privileges or Immunities Clause only three years before Slaughterhouse and it says – if it was the purpose of the 14th Amendment to provide federal protection for civil rights, then we would regard such a law just like we would regard a law apparently legalizing murder. So there was real political hostility to what the Republican Party had accomplished with the ratification of the 14th Amendment. There was a lot of what you what would be appropriately called reactionary conservative opposition to what had been done to the Constitution. And it took the form in 1877 of abandoning the the freed slaves by abandoning Reconstruction. And in the Supreme Court, it took the form of the slaughterhouse cases and other cases that followed in, in, the, in the years that came after that. There was, a, um, of course, the famous Cruikshank case, which w- involved the uh, uh, 
a race Colfax, riot, the Colfax, the, the riot, Colfax yeah. massacre, massacre, which is a fascinating story. And it's so. and the, that was a question about whether the Fourteenth Amendment protected the civil rights against state power. And the Supreme Court said, "Well, we already said slaughterhouse we, uh, cases. We already said no, so no." Interestingly, the, the the Colfax massacre occurred on the very same day that the slaughterhouse cases was announced. Oh, interesting. On April thirteenth, eighteen seventy three. So the Fourteenth Amendment, if we look at it um, in the proper way, in your interpretation, uh, does it? Would it be fair to say it brings back in the principles of the Declaration, Absolutely. back into the Constitution, right. back to the states, applying to the states what they always weren't allowed to do in the first place? Right. But this time we're just – now we really mean it this time and creates a floor below which the states can't go that that was there before because the Declaration – would, would, you, would you say the floor was there before? I th- absolutely it was. And I and, – and there had you know of course there, the constitution was ambiguous in some ways and one of the big ones one of the big ambiguities was what what role does the bill of rights have with regard to state governments there was the the famous case baron versus baltimore in which john marshall said that the bill of rights only applies to the federal government and you know that is a very plausible reading of the bill of rights everybody knew it was written in order to protect people against the federal government and you know it was uh, to add it to the federal constitution, not the state constitution. It made a lot of sense. And of course, the First Amendment is explicitly applied only to the federal government because it refers to Congress. So Marshall says it doesn't apply to the states. But you know, not all of the amendments say Congress. They say no person shall be deprived. You know, and that it doesn't say by what government, right? And so a group of people disagreed with Barron versus Baltimore. Uh, Professor Akilah Lamar calls them the Barron Contrarians. And they played a, a large role in the anti-slavery political thinking that led up to the, to the Civil War. And so one of the roles of the 14th Amendment was to clarify that point, to make clear that from now on, the, the guarantees of the federal constitution shall apply at the state level also. So uh, I- interesting, uh, the, the fact that so the, the Bill of Rights, though, people would say – um, some people would say, well, the Bill of Rights is what, what gives me these rights that I have against the government in this certain way. Um, and and it was applied to the federal government. Uh, the states had their own Bills of Rights. Uh, if someone says that the Bill of Rights, you know, when they walk and they say, I have the freedom of speech because of the Bill of Rights, what's what's wrong with saying that? Yeah, well, that's exactly – so the, the, the Bill of Rights only declares – these principles. It doesn't create these rights and it doesn't purport to create these rights. The language itself of the Bill of Rights doesn't purport to create these rights. The language of the Bill of Rights uses terms like no person shall be deprived or this right shall not be abridged. It doesn't say we shall extend this right or people shall have this right. So the Bill of Rights itself – Which was, is how you would use it for like a voting right because like yeah. that's, that's what you use for voting right. Yeah. You say we shall extend the right to vote to women. I, right. I, I'm not exactly sure. Well, that actually, right. I mean that, that is uh, a bit difficult because the – Way that voting rights are extended to women. I'm going to get the exact language here, but uh, it is using the Cato Pocket Constitution. Yes, using the Cato Pocket Constitution, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Yeah, but so it doesn't actually that. say we have created this right for women. Uh, it says that it shall not be abridged on account of sex, which means no one. Well, there's we'll a special have this history. As the reason that they are denied to vote. There's a special history there, though, because for one thing, women could vote in some states at the time of the ratification of the Constitution, um, so, and th- that right was then taken away in a reactionary movement in the 1790s and 1800s. And there were women who argued before the ratification of that amendment. There were women who argued that the Constitution never says that the right to vote shall be limited on the basis of sex or extends it only to men. And so many of them argued that against the 15th Amendment because the 15th Amendment was the first time that there was any constitutional acknowledgement of a state's authority to discriminate on the basis of sex when it came to voting rights. So they were doing in miniature what the anti-slavery constitutionalists had already done uh, with regard to slavery. They were saying the Constitution already prohibits the the government from depriving us of a right to vote that is created in the Constitution. And so with the ratification of the 19th Amendment, they again clarify that. Now, there's an, there's a, a, an interesting follow-up to that, which is the 19th Amendment doesn't just guarantee the right to vote. Um, Akhil Amar's new book, The America's Unwritten Constitution, has a marvelous chapter on this on this issue. What else does the 19th Amendment do? And he argues that the 19th Amendment should be read as a broader protection for equality for the rights of women. 
Well, the problem is that Amar leaves out the case that stands for this proposition, and that's one of my favorite Supreme Court cases, Adkins versus Children's Hospital, a 1932 decision in which the Supreme Court struck down a minimum wage law here in Washington, D.C. that applied only to women. Yeah. Interestingly enough, it was it was brought by a woman who had lost her job exactly. because she she was an elevator operator. If a I woman her named correct. Willie Lyons who worked at a at a hospital here in D.C. Yeah. and she liked her job, but she made less than the minimum wage. Now, of course, the minimum wage in this case only applied to women. So, what did these businesses do? They all fired all the women and hired men because they were cheaper. So she lost her job, so she sued. And there was an earlier case called Mueller versus Oregon that said that the government could pass minimum wage legislation for women only because women were dumber and weaker Delicate, yeah. and they needed the government to protect them. I mean it's that, sh- astonishing. It, interesting. Yeah, that's also the first Brandeis briefcase that's right. where Louis Brandeis, you know, great champion supposedly of, of liberal uh, causes, filed the first brief wherein you just dump on the court a ton of sociological data supporting your interpretation of the law and this was just a huge brief that was full of all these studies about how women so are, are weak and and they you know they need special care and their right. bones are brittle or anything else like that right yeah. and what justice sutherland then says 30 years later in in adkins he says okay maybe that was right then but with the ratification of the 19th Amendment, we now have said that women are equal to men and they are equal citizens and therefore the, under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, they cannot be deprived of liberty arbitrarily and they don't need the government to be looking over their shoulder telling them how to live their lives. And, and because, because that law, that case involves economic liberty, that's why Professor Omar leaves it out of his book mm-hmm. when it makes the strongest case for the argument that he's trying to make. Yeah, yeah. And it's an anti-minimum wage case. <laughs> now, not to be – too pedantic here, but you might very easily read the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments in their guarantee of rights for persons and say, hey, this isn't gender specific. Right. Uh, obviously, it was intended with the Fourteenth Amendment to be general with respect to race. But if it was intended to be specific with regard to gender, why wasn't it written that way? The words men and women were – very well known then. You know, right. Man and woman were known in the law. Right. Uh, but that's not what the text says. It says person. Uh, was this an intentional or unintentional error? Was this an assumption? And what role does does uh, the implicit assumption make in in the role of our of our constitutional interpretation? It strikes me this is very very important because we will look at a document like the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution and say, look, these are written in general terms uh, when, yes, the the authors of the documents may have written in, the, in those general terms, but clearly when they were enacted and when they were, when they were immediately acted upon, they were not acted upon in general terms. They were taken to mean that women are not uh, civilly equal to men and not going to be right. uh, equal citizens and, of course, that you know, there would be racial discrimination as well. Well, mm-hmm. I was going to say, if you were to take your question and, and substitute for women, substitute blacks for women, that is exactly the issue in Dred Scott. Mm-hmm. It, and and what, the, what the anti-slavery constitutionalists did was exactly what you've said. They said – they looked at the constitution. They said this makes no distinction based on race. So slavery, which consists in large part of depriving people of liberty without due process of law, therefore must be unconstitutional. Now, in our view, Nowadays, the, typically we look back at that and we say, what a ridiculous argument to make. Slavery was, was pervasive in society and you can't possibly say that it was already unconstitutional before the 13th Amendment was written. And yet, in fact, we are surrounded all the time by unconstitutional activity that we only later say, you know what, that, that, whole, was, actually that was unconstitutional. always unconstitutional. Exactly. And so I don't think it's that radical to begin with. And – Remember, there, the arguments on the other side were no less radical. The pro-slavery constitutionalists, for instance, John C. Calhoun, argued that there was in fact no such thing as an American nation. There was no such thing as federal citizenship. There was no American political society. There was only a treaty between sovereign states, which in fact is the exact opposite of what the Constitution actually says. But that is no less radical a position. Now, again, th- these were extreme positions, although – you know, Justice Curtis in his dissent in Dred Scott, he does make a, l- a large number of these arguments. Uh, but they were radical enough that they required amendment to the Constitution. But as far as women are concerned, absolutely. What Susan B. Anthony and her, and her colleagues were doing was arguing that the Constitution does not discriminate on the basis of sex and only when the 15th Amendment comes along does it imply that states are allowed to discriminate against women uh, when it comes to voting rights. Uh, 
I want to go back a little bit to the Bill of Rights because uh, uh, we have a good sort of rights thrust going here and also on enumerated or enumerated rights. Uh, when we talk about the Bill of Rights and the original non-inclusion of it in the, in the Constitution as it was released from the convention on September 17, 1787, uh, and people are often surprised like that the Bill of Rights was sort of a later codicil. Right. Say, and that's usually the first thing people think of when they think of the Constitution is yeah. often the First Amendment. Uh, why, did they, why did they so blatantly forget a Bill of Rights? Well, they didn't forget it. They were afraid that stating a Bill of Rights would imply that rights not listed were not protected by the Constitution. So Jefferson gets a copy of the Constitution. He was in France at the time. He gets a copy of the brand new Constitution before it had been ratified and he looks it over and he writes to Madison. He says, look, there's a couple of things I don't like. First, I don't like that the president can be perpetually reelected. I think it should be two terms only. And secondly, I think there should be a Bill of Rights. And Madison writes back and says, the problem is if you say people have the right to, to one thing, that kind of implies they don't have a right to another thing. So if you say they have the right to freedom of speech, freedom of press and freedom of religion, then clever lawyers are going to say that that means you don't have the right to things not listed. You don't have a right to run barefoot through sprinklers on a hot summer day. And so what we need to do is if we're going to write a Bill of Rights, we need to write it in such a way as to not imply that. And Madison became persuaded that he could do that. And the way to do it was the Ninth Amendment that says the enumeration of certain rights in the Constitution shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. And that's why the positivist interpretation of the Constitution oh, – Wait, what's that? Define positivist. Please. Positivism means that if there is – if the right is not listed, it's not a right. It says that – I mean positivism means that law is what we say it is. And so if there are, is no right listed, then it's not a right. And the reason why that is the wrong interpretation of the Constitution is because the Ninth Amendment says that's the wrong way to read the Constitution. Yeah. And, and, and that's a very reasonable fear at the time, historically speaking, when, when you look at grants of right that had been made before. So mm -hmm. if you consider, say, the Edict of Nantes in, in France, this right. was a very, very limited grant of religious liberty to one particular persuasion of Protestants. You couldn't just pick your own religion. Uh, you couldn't make up a new one. You were restricted to certain places and times and you're not allowed to build new houses of worship. You just have to keep with the ones that you have, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There were so many strings attached and it was very clear that the Edict of Nantes could be revoked at any time and eventually it was. Right. And obviously this is the sort of charter that, that they would not have wanted because then – well, then – of course, what eventually did happen would happen, which yeah. is that people would come along and construe the Bill of Rights to be a limited grant of rights and not one that was simply trying to spell out some small share of a much larger sphere of rights that that can't, in fact, be fully enumerated by anyone. And, and now you know, you know, my friend Clark Neely, who just wrote a book um, called Terms of Engagement, that's about the uh, the, the question of judicial activism and judicial restraint. He was at an event not long ago where he asked a prominent positivist judge named J. Harvey Wilkinson. And he asked him, well, suppose that the constitution were amended to say unenumerated rights, the right to run barefoot through sprinklers and so forth, shall be protected by the courts uh, when, when cases of that nature come before the court. Would you enforce such a, an amendment? And Judge Wilkinson said no. Well, so it's not a question of that's, whether it's – That's what the Ninth Amendment that's actually what the says. the Ninth Amendment does, exactly. And, and it's very puzzling to me also to watch people try to reason their way out of the Ninth Amendment because I like to say everyone actually believes in the Ninth Amendment to some degree. It's just a question of what other rights they think that people have. So for example, I don't think anyone believes that you have no right to breathe the air. No. I don't think right. anyone believes wake, wake that you have you no to. right – to travel. Right. Virtually everyone will say, yes, you have a right to travel in the United States. Maybe there might have to be some restrictions in you know, cases of emergency. Maybe you have to follow traffic laws. That's fine. But you, in principle, have a right to go from one place to the other within the United States without being stopped. Uh, that's something that is not anywhere else in the Constitution. If it's anywhere, it is in the Ninth Amendment and I think properly so. Yeah, I th the right to travel is an absolutely great example. Yeah, so, because Slaughterhouse. <laughs> it's because Slaughterhouse yeah. and because it's not listed in the Constitution and yet it is taken as one of the bedrock ideas of what freedom means and the courts have always protected it. And the reason why is they say, well, the 14th Amendment protects liberty. 
And what, is it, what do you mean by liberty? Well, let's look at Blackstone or Co- Cook or, or ancient or, or, and modern uh, legal scholars. And Blackstone says liberty includes the freedom from bodily restraint and traveling wherever you want to. That's the, the most basic meaning of liberty. And so they say, OK, well, the 14th Amendment protects liberty. Blackstone says liberty includes freedom from restraint. Therefore, freedom of restraint is protected by the Constitution. That's how we protect unenumerated rights. Now, I find it ironic that we talk about unenumerated rights because liberty is an enumerated right. The Constitution says you have the right to liberty and it's protected by the Constitution. That's why that's the subtitle of my book. So when we, when we interpret the term liberty in today's world, what we do is exactly the same thing. We say, OK, we protect liberty. What do we mean by liberty? And then we look in the, in the legal scholarship. We have these kinds of uh, philosophical debates, historical analysis and so forth, and we protect liberty that way. Um, so yeah, the, uh, you brought up J. Harvey Wilkinson, which I think is a, is a good way to segue with this point into a question of, of how therefore do you as a, as a libertarian and other libertarians tend to view this role of, of enforcing – uh, the Constitution versus what J. Harvey Wilkinson would view and, and where is the, the tension there? As I see it, Judge Wilkinson is the final collapse of positivism. I mean Wilkinson's book is basically saying there is no such thing as political theory – I mean as, as constitutional theory. His, the thesis of his book is that everybody is wrong. There is no – there's no validity to any interpretation of the constitution, period, and there cannot be. And the reason why, he says, is because for there to be an interpretation, of, a theory of the constitution would intrude our – on our inalienable right to self-government. Mm-hmm. That's what he says. It's the only time in his so That's the only right we have. It's the only right yeah. he refers to. It's to go and vote in elections. Uh, it's right. Appear it, before administrative Exactly. Committees, and yeah. it's not only a right but an inalienable right. Mm-hmm. And the, what's ironic about that is that the founders, founders never believed there was any such thing as an inalienable right to self-government. There was no right to self-government whatsoever. There's no right to government. Mm-hmm. The government is a permission. Gover- we give government the authority, the, the, the power to govern us, but it's not a right. That's the whole point of being anti-monarchical. Yeah. <laughs> so – but it's – again, it's the only right that Judge Wilkinson recognizes and therefore he nat- naturally comes to the conclusion that any kind of individual right must conflict with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and he follows in a line of positivists who have said the same thing. From Judge, the left and the right. That's right. Mo- and I think mostly from the right. Mm-hmm. Judge Bork, for example, says um, – he criticizes Marbury versus Madison he, uh, because he is basically anti-judicial review at all. He thinks that the courts should not be in the business of, of enforcing the constitution by striking down laws that the legislature so what now, they- now, that's very very hard for me to understand as a, as a position intellectually because uh, I've read the Federalist Papers and it's very clear – that uh, the proponents of the Constitution imagined that the courts would be doing this. Absolutely. Alexander Hamilton talks about how the courts will do this. Right. And uh, so it's very difficult for me to see how anyone could have been taken by surprise at this. It was a clear implication of the text. Marbury versus Madison explains how it is right. such a clear implication of the text. And given that it was talked about beforehand, you made a deal. You made a bargain. It was well understood at the time. It was practiced by state courts already at the time of the ratification of the Constitution. Federalist 78 explains it very clearly and the Constitution's text does require it because it says laws made in pursuance of this Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land, which means there are some laws out there that are not in pursuance of the Constitution and that are therefore not the supreme law of the land. And every branch has the duty to obey the Constitution. So there you go. So the uh – the view here of extreme deference to democratic majorities, is it, is it that they're absolute democracy fetishists or are they afraid of something? I, well, I, one blurs into the other. They're I mean I, I always think that the, the, the conservatives started being afraid of, yeah. of – if, if you let us do it, then, then someone else might do it wrong and then right. therefore we, no one should do it. My, yeah. my sense is that, uh, is that people who uh, – take the extreme position of democracy over liberty are making possibly the very most respectable and the nicest possible form of the argument ad baculum. Now, I, I have a stick and my greater force is what will carry the issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not a legitimate argument in logic and the argument that there is a majority that wants to do something politically is not necessarily a legitimate one in, in politics either. I was at an event uh, some years ago uh, that w- where a speaker was a, a prominent law professor who's very anti-natural rights. 
And in the end, I said, well, now you have this choice to make between democracy as your value and liberty as your value, and you choose democracy. Why? You've told us already that there is no validity to moral propositions. There's no such thing as rights. It's all just how you feel. When you say that people have freedom of speech, all that means is that you like the idea that they should be able to speak. It's purely an emotional preference. You have no intellectual basis for that. That's what you've said. So why do you choose democracy? And his answer was, "Mm, I, I just do. It's just as arbitrary as any other choice. Well, then why not choose dictatorship? Yeah. Well, so we're out, we're out there though. We're looking for these rights um, and uh, you've discussed how uh, – in the book, you discuss the, the doctrine of substantive due process um, which is uh, being called uh, I mean, a obviously oxymoronic phrase by some people, uh, very, very looked down upon by Justice Scalia for example. Um, but something – has something to do with unenumerated rights, but you defend it. Yes. In fact, um, you're right that they've called it all sorts of names. It seems like there's like a competition to come up with the nastiest way of referring to the theory of substantive due process. So what is the theory first? And the then, theory and then... of substantive due process is the idea that the due process clause, which says you cannot be deprived of liberty without due process of law. The idea is that this clause prohibits the government from doing certain things to you regardless of how it does them to you. Some people read that clause as meaning that the government owes you a hearing or a trial before it takes away your life, liberty, or property. But the theory of substantive due process is the idea that the constitution prohibits the government from arbitrarily depriving you of life, liberty, or property at all. And so procedural due process then is only one small component of substantive due process. It's because the government cannot arbitrarily deprive you of liberty that it then has to give you a trial or a hearing or something like that. And this came under fire beginning really in the 1930s, 1940s. In fact, the very phrase substantive due process didn't exist before the 1940s. Before then, it was just due process of law. So someone – did someone invent it to try and make it sound ridiculous? Exactly. And it be – and I mean it reaches back to Magna Carta. If you look at the English common law decisions from before the American founding, first of all, all of those decisions protect unenumerated rights because the rights were unenumerated because there's no written constitution in, in England. And they did so under the law of the land clause of Magna Carta. The law of the land clause says the government cannot deprive you of liberty or property except by the law of the land. And then the question is what does law of the land mean? Not just statutes and legislation. It means general principles. It means in a lawful way. And that means not arbitrarily, not because the government just wants to, not because the majority has decided to take your freedom away. There has to be some justification for its restrictions on your liberty or taking of your private property. And that was the argument that Daniel Webster made in his epical oral argument in the Dartmouth College case of 1819. Yeah, the one that went on for 10 hours or yes, something Yes, like and it's a masterpiece, you know, and it was studied for generations by law students who, of course, don't study it today. And it was quoted over and over again by the Supreme Court itself saying this is what substantive due process means. Well, you look at Robert Bork. He says that the first substantive due process case was Dred Scott in the 1850s, you know, another untruth from Judge Bork. Um, substantive due process is correct because we are promised not just any process but a process of law. Is the, is the Red Queen's trial of Alice in Alice in Wonderland a trial? Of course it's not a trial because when we talk about trial, we mean a fair process whereby an adjudication follows based on reasons that, that arise from the evidence. In the same way, an arbitrary assertion of government power isn't a law because it's just ipsy dixit as they say in Latin. It's just because I say so. And so the due process clause prohibits the government from taking any of our rights away simply as an act of force. My favorite is there's an eight circuit – actually, it's two eight circuit cases on whether the government can force you to cut your hair. Really? And they, the As court, a mil- military context? The, no, it's public schools. Oh. Uh, and the court says that it cannot force you to cut your hair just arbitrarily. There has to be some reason related to school discipline or something like that that justifies forcing you to cut but your hair. But where's the enumerated right of, of exactly, right to not right? have your hair, right? Well, I mean there are religious groups that – do not cut their hair for religious reasons. Sure, true. And, That's right. uh, I imagine they might have they might have a free exercise case there, but not everyone would certainly. Man, I'm, I'm not a Sikh, and you know, the Sikhs are the ones who do not cut their hair for religious reasons. So maybe that would be a problem for me, but not for them. And no. and and that raises the question of why should it in fact be that way? Uh, should those rights not be equal? Well, 
Yeah, that that does raise the question. Uh, but I do want to go back to what Tim, you were talking about the justification um, uh, and law. Uh, uh, and then we can come back and apply, apply some maybe what Jason's question was of because you're even asking for a justification, that seems to raise it to some level, right? Uh, if you just you have to justify, it. Like, right. even if it's something, you yes. have to justify. It. Because we presume that all people are free, and the government can only take freedom away for some yeah. good reason. Yeah, and the government can't, are not like your parents who can tell you because I said so, Ipsy Dixit, all the time, right? That's right? And then also, it seems like you're saying that the term "law" in these contexts of due process of law, law of the land clause of the Magna Carta, is actually a, a term of art in a way that maybe we've forgotten that law is a term of art. It right? incorporates it describes a specific type of going about doing things. That's right. It incorporates substantive values. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean just whatever the legislature says it means. And the, we know that that must be true because if that were true, then it, the, the clause would mean, be meaningless. It would mean that the legislature could pass a law taking away your freedom and then when you say, well, this violates my due process rights, they would say no because we passed a law to take away your freedom. You know, And that would be question begging. So we know it can't mean that. And, when you, and then when you look at the legal history, you see that the phrase comes from Magna Carta and all of those common law cases that were written at the time. And, and I, uh, that is a far stronger protection. Uh, far, it has a far stronger basis in the constitutional history than the notion that due process law just means whatever the legislature says it means. If that's what law means, then why have a constitution at all? Yeah, and why, does, why do you just have a dictatorship with force? Yeah. Now, some of this sits very badly with one particular footnote. The Caroline Products footnote yeah, four, four right. uh, which I would like you to talk about a little bit because I think it's a, a very instructive bit of of jurisprudence that uh, causes a lot of things to make sense uh, about how where how are, rights are, are interpreted and, and how how we arrived at where we are now uh, that probably all libertarians ought to know a bit about. Yes, that's true. But it is also somewhat misunderstood by some libertarians and that is a lot of people think that what happened was that the Supreme Court, the famous switch in time that saved nine, the, they think that well, in 1937, the Supreme Court just woke up and changed the constitution. Or at least Owen Roberts did. And, yeah, and, and this was a, a sudden shift that was based on their fear of the court packing plan of 1936 and ever since then, everything's been different. Well, it's not quite as simple as that uh, and we know that because in 1934 – Three years before the so-called switch in time, the Supreme Court decided Nebbia versus New York and Blaisdell versus Home and Building and Savings and Loan Corporation. And in both of those cases, the court strongly reduced, I mean sharply reduced protections for economic liberty and set the stage, I mean created the so-called rational basis test in the Nebbia case, which watered down constitutional protections for freedom of contract and private property rights. It was, and then the, the switch in time in 1937 came after that. All, now, what, what I think a better way of interpreting what really happened in the 30s – now, the 30s was a horrible time. 1930s has to be the worst decade in human history. Uh, w. H. Auden called it the a low dishonest decade, right? And yeah, I mean, I think maybe like some random decade in the eighth century was probably pretty <laughs> bad too. But I'll, I'll go, I'll go with that. But I guarantee you, more people were killed in the nineteen thirties than the nineteen thirties. That's true. Uh, and what happened? So that is a blink of the of an eye in the history of the law. But it wasn't just nineteen thirty seven. Um, what happened was that the court reduced protections for individual liberty dramatically in 1934 and then in 1938 in the, in the Caroline Products case, it said, OK, look, some rights will get stronger protection and it listed those rights for the most part in that footnote four. And at the same time, the rights that it particularly focuses on in that footnote are rights that can be reconstrued in a democratic way. These are rights like speech and the right to vote and things like that that have a role to play in democracy. So the court is not only saying it will protect these rights more than it said a few years ago in, in the Nebbia case, but it's saying that we're going to protect rights that – are important for the democratic process as opposed to individual rights. And so it's also what the court did is it, recon it reconstructed the concept of individual rights in terms of how it serves democracy. And ever since then, the idea has been that individual rights are protected in order to serve democracy as opposed to uh, the democracy exists to protect individual rights. Well, can, uh, I think it's also worth filling us in on what what the actual issue was in Caroline Products and why they didn't want to protect this. Well, it, Caroline Products was a case about an economic liberty case about the restriction on what you could put into uh, certain dairy products. Filled well, milk. It was, milk. It was a product it. itself. Filled yeah. milk. I mean, and, which sounds disgusting. It was skim milk. 
uh, that was then added. There was different types of other fat yeah, added back oils, into right. the milk. Like so you could use like, I don't know, like fish oil or something like that, which you would refatten up the milk uh, right. by, by using it. That's right. And, and, and what the court said was it said, well, we're going to presume economic re- restrictions to be constitutional unless proven otherwise. And that it had already said that in the Nebia case. So that really wasn't all that new. A little footnote, um, our, our friend Josh Blackman has done some research and found that the, that uh, the Caroline Products Company actually ended up winning its case in the Eventually, 1970s. Yeah. <laughs> Decades it, later, it finally had that it, law struck it's still, down. It's still – yeah, it's a mill nut is what it's called. Uh, uh, that, that's a fascinating story by itself. Even fascinating too, which I think is relevant to the cronyism we talk about now, is that if you look at the history of the Filled Milk Act of 1923 is what mm-hmm. it actually is called, uh, when they decided to pass this – um, the dairy industry sat down and looked Congress in the face and said, this filled milk is is hurting a vital national industry and that vital national industry was dairy. Right. And that was the – and so they, they went up to Congress, looked them in the face and said, pass this crony capitalism law and the filled milk industry had said – had these points which were very valid uh, and which was that filled milk is used by poor people more because you don't have to refrigerate it and refrigerators are fairly common and it's cheaper. So they made a le- – the dairy companies made a legal, a, a viable product that was not a health risk based on crony capitalism. And then when the court was asked to look at this law, they didn't. That's right. And yeah. I think it's relevant to a lot of stuff that's happening now and, and the kind of vision that the libertarian constitution would have that, that you can stop crony capitalism. With a with not entirely, but you could do a, a lot by having a libertarian constitution. Right. I'd like to ask two questions from the standpoint of someone who is a a defender of this modern uh, democracy based approach to rights. Uh, the first is, what do you actually have against democracy? Do you believe that democracy is wrong in some sense? Do you believe that it is dangerous? Do you believe that? perhaps a small group of, of knowledgeable aristocrats or of particularly ideologically sympathetic people should be running the government. Is that really what you want? And second, what is the danger of asking majorities to protect rights? Majorities in this country actually care about rights and they will perform their duties accordingly. They will vote for protections of rights. It's very unlikely I, I've heard this from progressives. It's very unlikely that democratic majorities are going to oppress minorities here. It just doesn't happen anymore. So relax about this. Well, I, the, the, at first I was going to say that I would use your second question to answer your first, which is that I'm not so much anti-democracy, but I'm very much against making it into a fetish or, or saying that democracy is the source of all political good, which is what we're propagandized to every day in this country. We're told that democracy is the source of our political greatness and all this sort of thing. And Spreading just, democracy. Would, just yeah. not true. Um, democracy is good insofar as it fits within the spectrum of political goods. And so democracy is a useful tool to protect individual rights. That's what Madison says in The Federalist. And he makes that argument that in, about this, what, what modern uh, progressives often say, that, that if you have a balance of interests, that none of them can gang up on, on a minority and beat them up and take away their things. Of course, that wasn't even true in Madison's day. Uh, Witness the glaring fact of American life at the time, which was slavery. So it is entirely possible and we see every day majorities ganging up and violating the rights of individuals. It's done on a minute by minute basis in this country. I am just – it astonishes me that we express so much worry about courts violating the constitution or exceeding their authority as if they are the ones out there taking away our freedom when it is legislatures violating the constitution every minute of every day in every state and at the federal level taking away liberty after liberty after liberty harming people and getting away with it in on the theory that democracy somehow justifies it so my problem is with democracy being elevated above liberty as a constitutional value the constitution says that liberty is a blessing it does not say that about democracy The word doesn't appear in the Declaration of Independence or in the Constitution. Founders were rightly suspicious of democracy and they tried to create a system of checks and balances to restrain democracy to get its benefits while preventing its harms. And we fiddled with the system so much that we have a lot of its harms coming back on us. So we are running out of time, but we each have one parting question for you. And my question is, if you could add one amendment to the US Constitution on a single subject, what would that amendment be? I'm reminded my father always says that uh, he would like to amend the Constitution to say 
um, breaking the law is illegal. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it, and I think a good amendment would be, um, and we mean it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, because the, I don't think that the Constitution needs that much amending. I think that the Constitution needs to be followed. And the problem with the modern legal interpretation, the so-called living Constitution, is that it in fact is a dead Constitution. It's a Constitution with all sorts of dead spots in it. Um, we now have a constitution where the public use restriction on the power of eminent domain is basically meaningless. For Another example. example of cronyism too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and I think – so I would say I don't think that the constitution needs that much amending. I do think there are some things in the constitution I disagree with. I don't believe in intellectual property rights, for example. And so the patent clause you know, troubles me. It's clearly constitutional, but I don't think it's justifiable. So I, there are some things I might tinker with. Um, restoring state legislative power over – over choosing senators I think could be beneficial, although it also has some downsides that we sometimes overlook. So I, I might do some tinkering. But no, I don't think that the Constitution needs radical amendment. So yeah, I've always been partial to the uh, no one can be president who wants to be president amendment <laughs> and the uh, no air conditioning in federal buildings. Because if, yes. if you've ever been in D.C. in the right. summer, this is the only way I can think of how to get them to not go to work. That's right. So as the final question, we've learned a lot about the the, the – True, your view of the interpretation of the Constitution and and how it is a very very powerful force for liberty. So so what is the libertarian Constitution? Why is it better? And, and what should we do? What how should we use it to make the world better? Anything that's left of it, if we can actually use it. I think the the, the libertarian Constitution is a Constitution that protects individual liberty against uh, the the forces most likely to take that liberty away, and that is legislators, presidents, and courts. And it provides a wonderful system of checks and balances to protect those those rights. I think the founding fathers had a vision in mind of a society where the government didn't play a constant role in your life. I mean we have a system – you asked about amendments. We have a system where the interpretation of the Commerce Clause is so broad that the federal government today dictates to us everything from the thickness of ketchup to the angle at which your office chairs can lean back. That is not what the Founding Fathers intended. Um, so now – you know, another amendment that occurs to me is an amendment to, that that uh, Milton Friedman proposed, which was to say that the the right to engage in honest trade shall not be impaired. Unfortunately, the founding fathers thought that that right was so obvious. Why would anybody take it away? And now it's so restricted that we are really killing the golden goose. I think, rightly understood, the Constitution is a glorious liberty document. That was that's a phrase from one of my heroes, Frederick Douglass, one of the great intellectuals in American history. Uh, he was asked late in life what he thought about the so-called Negro problem, and he said, "There is no Negro problem. The problem is whether the American people have honesty en enough, bravery enough, patriotism enough to live up to their own constitution." And I think we libertarians only have to demand that. Thank you, Tim, and thank you for listening. If you have any questions about this podcast or about anything on libertarianism.org, you can find me on Twitter at T.C. Burris. That is T-C-B-U-R-R-U-S. You can find me on Twitter at Jason Kuznicki. That is J-A-S-O-N-K-U-Z-N-I-C-K-I. And my Twitter feed is at Timothy Sandifer. That's S-A-N-D-E-F-U-R. And my blog is at sandifer.typepad.com. I'd like to thank Tim for joining us and Jason for filling in. Free Thoughts is a podcast project of libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute, and it is produced by Evan Banks. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, please visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.